So this brings us up to what we talked about right at the end of class last time, which was looking at an example where you, let's say, have a sequentially consistent processor. And we take a piece of code that we had talked about at the beginning of class last time and ask ourselves, does this still work? And what we're going to do is instead of having one producer and one consumer, we're going to have one producer and two consumers, or multiple consumers. So shown here, we have one producer. It has a register where it keeps the tail pointer. There's the two different pointers here in memory, the actual data storage of the queue. Two consumers, they have their own register sets because they're two different processors or two different complete uh, threads. So they have registers which they cache effectively. It's not a cache, but they effectively have to load it into their register space. And then they actually have where they will load the actual value that they pop off the end of the queue. So someone, I think, said this at the end of the class here. But if you're going to be executing the producer, this piece of producer code, and you're going to execute this consumer code, does anyone see a problem here of something that can happen that we probably don't want for a first in, first out queue with multiple readers? Yeah. So. Let's, let's walk through that. Let's say two consumers are execute. We, we interleave two consumers executing the same instruction at, uh, from one consumer thread and the other consumer thread every other cycle. So we have the first consumer will read the head pointer into head. The second consumer will read the head pointer into its own head register. This consumer here will read the tail pointer into the tail register. The second consumer will do that same thing. So all of a sudden, the two consumers read the same heads and the same tail. And this is sequentially consistent, because we've not done, none, done no reordering between, uh, within the thread. Uh, we've just done some valid interleaving. Now they both check this. This is the, the case which is basically saying, is there anything in the queue? Is the head equal to the tail? If the head equals the tail, there's nothing in the queue. If there's a distance between the head and the tail, that means there's some entries in the queue. So they both fall through and they say, well, yeah, there's, there's stuff in the queue. The next thing they do is they go read from the head. And this is the value that they're going to use. Well, they both just read the same head pointer. Because we are going to execute from one thread, we're going to load that value, and we're going to execute from the other thread. So all of a sudden, we just read the same value twice. In one's the one thread, and one's the other thread, but it was the same, same value that we get out of reading from the, the pointer that points to the, the, the head, if you will. Now, in a perfect world, that would be the only bad thing that could happen in this case. Because we would increment, the, they would both increment the head pointers, and then they, they do stores here. And they effectively, what would happen is they would write the same uh, uh, head location into the, the, or the same pointer, if you will, into, into the head. That's not so bad, but effectively what we did is we enqueued one thing into the queue and we got two things out of the queue. And this breaks our semantics of what a queue should actually do. Something that could happen that's much worse here is that one of the threads let's say another valid interleaving, is the one thread just stalls for a long time somewhere in here. And like a billion cycles. It just stalls for a billion cycles. It takes a really bad cache miss, or it, it traps into the operating system, or something bad happens to it. What can happen is before the update of the head pointer happens, or um, what, could, what could happen here is you could have something really strange happen or, or you could basically have the other thread execute, and it could pop a whole bunch of values off the head of the queue in the meantime. So let's say there was 100 things in the queue. We both execute into here at the same time. One of the threads gets stalled here for a long period of time. The other thread pops 100 things off the queue. But then finally, this one here goes and updates the head pointer again. So what's going to happen is effectively you are basically going to um, reset the queue and put 100 things back onto the queue. And it's probably going to be garbage in memory in the queue at that time. 
So this brings up the idea that we may not want to be concurrently executing, even in sequentially, even in a strict sequentially consistent model, this block of code and another thread's uh, piece of code which is executing the same, same thing, the, the two consumers. So we're going to call this a critical section. Um, if you take an operating systems class, you'll have seen this, seen this a bunch. And the idea here is that you want to atomically execute from all the consumers possible this block of code here. So no two consumers could begin to execute that block of code at the same time. And uh, one way to do that is you have a, a lock on that piece of code. So you grab a lock, you can go execute that piece of code, and then you release the lock. Questions so far? OK, so a little bit more general notion of this, the same idea of a, of a lock is, is called a semaphore. And if you take an operating system class, you've probably seen these, these strange nomenclatures of P and V semaphores. And um, if you want to go look up where it actually comes from, it's Dutch. And P largely means uh, attempt to acquire the semaphore. But in, in, in Dutch, it means, uh, I don't speak, does anyone here speak Dutch by chance? Anyone speak anything close to Dutch? <laughs> you do? A little bit? OK, how do, how do, how do we say that? <laughs> what, what is close to Dutch, actually? German. German's close to Dutch? Yeah, OK, I guess it's. Um, so I don't, I don't speak Dutch or German, um, but it means try to reduce. In a semaphore, you can have multiple people trying to grab a lock at the same time, and multiple people can actually be to acquire that lock at the same time. So an example, uh, or acquire the semaphore at the same time, the example we gave in last class is that you have multiple users trying to use one I.O. device, and there's, let's say, two queues in the I.O. device. You have 100 different processors or threads trying to use that one I.O. device. You can actually have strictly only two acquire the I.O. device, but not more than two. In a mutex, you're only allowed to have one thing be able to acquire the critical section or acquire the lock at a time. And hence, we have a little bit more general term for this. A P semaphore basically uh, decrements a counter. So we start off with a counter S here. We put some number into it. And then we do a, a P on that, and it'll actually decrease the counter. And if the counter was greater than 0, we can go execute our critical section. Then we have the release, or the V semaphore. And that will actually increment this counter by 1. And it'll wake up some other process if there is some other process waiting on that. Um, if, if, if S had dropped below uh, 1, it'll go wake up another process. <clears throat> and one of the important things here is that these, both these P and these V semaphores must be atomic relative to each other. So however you go think about going to implement them, they must, they must be atomic relative to each other. And this is uh, with respect to everything happening, everything else happening on your system. Otherwise, really, really bad things will start to happen. You'll actually uh, have multiple people grabbing the lock. And how you typically use this is inside of your thread or your process. You're going to put your critical section and put the acquire here and the release there. And one important thing to, here to note is these semaphores, um, you can have the value s here determine how many, the, the initial value of s rather determines how many different threads or processes are able to enter the critical section concurrently. If S is initially set to 1, that means one, only one thread is allowed to go in there. And that's what's called a mutex. So it's mutually exclusive. Only one, thing, only one thread can go into the critical section at that time. 